I get our minds now uh, back, um, not away from Hebrew, let's uh, keep our minds back here. Uh, let's focus uh, on, on the Hebrew of, of Genesis 49. Uh, Genesis 
about a dozen, I guess, uh, times in the Old Testament. And it, it so happens that in a particular passage, we select the treatment. And this starts with a, a lot of uh, the instances of Alfred and Hyde being emerged. And Boston uh, surveys them and, and uh, comes to general conclusions of the new text of the group that they raise the kind of the much of individual eschatology but corporate technology. And that is a phrase uh, that signifies the, the ultimate issue of it. Uh, not simply and barely a matter of chronological maturity as so, though now here's something that's going to happen in the distant future, not in the distant future, all right? Uh, but, but beyond that, this is the, the ultimate disposition of the matter. This is uh, uh, how it all turns out in the end. So we're again, the regime in the beginning here. Rahari, uh, here's the eschatological goal of things at the end of the day. And so that wherever it is used, it is, uh, uh, has to do with the ultimate horizon of, of the speaker's uh, vision. And it has to do, therefore, with the new covenant. It has to do with the new covenant age, the messianic age, and, and even as a philosopher in some particular uh, context that has to do with the more stable, static, permanent uh, stage of, of eternity beyond the consummation. So it is a, a definite pointer then and, uh, for, for us uh, in our exegesis uh, that we are not just dealing with old testament typological development today, but we are dealing with the ultimate aspect of the reality, the ultimate eschatological goal. So he, he then proceeds. Uh, and uh, that's the key thing we want to get. He, he goes on in the second verse to tell them uh, again to gather and hearken those are sons of Jacob, yes, listen to Israel, your father. And then in verse 3, uh, he proceeds into the, uh, one by one with the, the, uh, with the uh, his, his sons, and he deals with them in terms of, uh, the, 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 of their mothers. The arrangement is according to the mothers of the twelve sons. He begins with, with uh, Leah, uh, his wife Leah's six uh, uh, sons in verses 3 to 15. And then he proceeds in verses 16 to 21 to deal with the uh, the sons of the two handmaids that uh, he had. And he concludes then in verses 22 to 27 with the two sons of, of Rachel. So he, the things are arranged according to to the mothers, and, and within that, pretty much, I guess, according to uh, seniority. And uh, that being the case, uh, he, he, he begins then with Reuben and Simeon and, and uh, Levi. Uh, most prominent uh, are, of course, going to be the, uh, Judah, of course, is going to be the, the one where we pay the bigger attention, because that would be the Messianic line from which the, the Shiloh figure emerges. And so in verses 8 through 12, uh, that that uh, block of material is given to, to Judah. And then uh, also a lengthy block of material is given to the, the, the Joseph sons in verses 22 through 26. And, 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 and the, the quantity of material in, in the, the literary presentation here uh, also corresponds to the historical reality that those two tribes, Judah and the Joseph tribes, uh, uh, get the most lion's share of the attention here, uh, also, of course, with the two most prominent conspicuous ones in the, in the, the actual history. But as I say, it begins then with the Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, and although dominantly in the these are, are going to be blessing uh, sanctions or uh, inheritances that are, are, are described, uh, uh, these first three are very much overclouded. And because of recollection of offenses or sins of, of uh, the parties in, in uh, question. And uh, so with uh, uh, Reuben's uh, violation of the, the marriage bed of his father and with the, and with the treachery of Simeon and, and, and Levi and uh, Shechem, which uh, Jacob uh, had to go along with, but which he didn't forget uh, the, the, what should have been the blessing of Reuben, Simeon, and Levi are all uh, rather much overclouded. And so by the time we come, as we do next to Judah, uh, it's, it's the customary business of the dark background uh, against which the, the light of this blessing shines all the more uh, brightly. And uh, so that much, uh, then we, we, we move on right away to verses 8 through 12. And... Uh, Uh, 
puns that we have seen in the case of, of Noah's uh, curses and blessings uh, uh, appear here again in the case of, of, the, of the Judith name. And so you remember in the case of uh, Noah's Ark, Pandan, Canaan, the verb Pana to subjugate, Pandan, the name Shane, which means name, to indicate the, the covenant relationship the name of God was given to the Semites, especially the Abrahamites. And the verb Panta to open was a pun on, on Japheth, they God Yahweh together. Uh, and so puns, puns, puns that they were fond of. And uh, the idea then is uh, that, that the, the nomad is a nomad. The, the name has it is fraught with the destiny of uh, the person uh, within it. So that's uh, the way it begins here in Genesis 49, verse 8. Yehuda, as for you, now there, now we come to we had Simeon, uh, we had Reuben, we had Simeon and Levi, now verse 8, Yehuda, and uh, Judah, Ata, as for you, and now we hear the pun, Yehuda, now Yehuda, and uh, it's the same pun as a matter of fact that, uh, that Jacob is using now that uh, had been used by Leah, the mother, in the original naming uh, of, uh, the, uh, of the son. Back in the, the, the book of, of, of Genesis, uh, uh, this uh, I forget what the details of, of the, this time the Lord has blessed me, and, and so she was praising the, the Lord. Uh, I guess it's Genesis 29:35, yeah, but for the original naming of the son by Leah, Genesis 29:35, where she says, "This time I will praise the Lord," uh, and therefore she called him from the verb yada to praise. She called him. Uh, and uh, now it's a, a similar word play that uh, Jacob uses, Yehuda, as for you, Yehuda, that same verb, Yahyada, to, to praise. And the subject is your brothers. Your brothers are going to praise you. And uh, now there are two more clauses. Uh, the, the third one will sort of duplicate the, the first, as a case sort of a synonymous parallelism. And then sandwiched in between the two is, is the explanation for it. Uh, so the, uh, looking at it first then to the third clause, the, the last clause, uh, corresponding to your brothers will praise you, Yoduka Aheka, is uh, the B'nai Avita, the sons of your father, because your brothers have. Huh? And uh, the equivalent of the verb Yada is now the verb to Yishtachawu, uh, from the verb shakha, to, uh, which means that to, to archava, rather, which uh, means uh, to uh, bow down. The formation of this verb is on, on the usual. It has uh, three radicals in the, in the preformative, I call it a hishtakia form, uh, from uh, the verb shakha, uh, but it's a very common. We know what it means. It means to, to prostrate oneself to worship and so on. And uh, so your, your brothers will praise you. Yes, the sons of your father are, are going to re reverence uh, you. And uh, why are they going to do this? Well, now the middle clause. Yadaka or Oyebeka. Uh, yad, your hand. And then following the, the Masoretic pointing, we'll be speaking about a suggestion of the emendation. Uh, but the, the Masoretic rendering of it here. Uh, the aura would be upon the neck. Your hand will be upon the neck of Oyebeka, your enemies. So the picture then is one of the, the military powers of, uh, of Judith. And you see then that that motif that, of the, the military, of the warfare of Christ, of the, the seed of the woman, and, and then the, the serpent, and so on, that we found already in Genesis 3.15, uh, that military motif that uh, continued in Noah's oracle. And uh, was the center for the relationship of, of the, the Semites possessing the land and, and the Canaanites being uh, cursed as the corollary to that. That military motif now continues uh, uh, here. And uh, so, in, in recognition of, of the military victories and achievements of, of Judah, uh, he will rise to preeminence in the, the midst of the brothers. And so, there's going to be this new direction in the leadership of, of the descendants of Jacob. When, when uh, this oracle was delivered, well, of course, they were under a patriarchal system, and, and Jacob was uh, still the patriarchal head of, of uh, the whole uh, community. Uh, and uh, yet, from the point of view of their immediate circumstances down there in, in Egypt, well, of course,
course, uh, Joseph uh, uh, was uh, the, the leader of, of the family because of the power of the Egypt. So there was, uh, there was a sort of a dynastic principle that was operating in, in the, the patriarchal period, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and there's something more of a uh, leadership by virtue of charismatic endowment that we have in the case of Joseph, who was, uh, who was gifted by the Lord, and who was in a place in a situation where he came to expression. And uh, now we're pointing to a, a future day uh, when the, the leadership is not going to be entrenched in, in, in Joseph, uh, but in, in the mind of, of Judah. And it's going to include at the outset, once again, sort of special gifting of God in the case of David, uh, who will be so gifted by God's spirit. And, and again, it's a matter of the especially the military prowess. And, and, uh, but also, the dynastic principle comes back in, not as a matter of the patriarchal succession, but now in terms of the, the, the royal dynasty succession of the dynasty of David. But here's a new day coming when the leadership is going to take this new direction. Uh, within Israel, and uh, the leadership is going to uh, be established in, in Judah. It will be a matter then of royal leadership. It will be a matter of, of, uh, of kingship, so that as we move on, it's, uh, it's uh, symbolized in terms of the scepter and the rule of staff as uh, represented in it specifically. Before moving on, however, as I said, there are some, some suggestions uh, about the rule re repointing it here. As we have it then, it's uh, the pun is Yehuda and, and Yodukal. <clears throat> Not that, that, that is clear enough. Now, some would suggest that the Yadikala, and in any case, the, 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 in terms of the sound, that there, there certainly is a, a, continue, a poetic continuation of a repetition of the same sounds that you get there in, in Yadika, <clears throat> with the, the Dalit and so on. Uh, but beyond that, there's also some, the uh, suggestion that Yadika should be repointed to read once again uh, uh, Yoduka. Uh, and uh, the thought would be then, uh, as for you, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Yes, they will praise you. Reading Yoduka again, they will praise you. But now you see, if you change uh, Yadika, your hand, uh, to Yoduka, then you also have to change the next word. Your hand on the neck of your enemies, uh, uh, then Orak would be a noun. <laughs> Uh, more commonly, I guess it's in the foot on the neck of your enemies, and in fact, that, uh, that is appealed to by those who want to make these changes. Uh, who say then that the, the, the imagery of, of your hand on the neck is in a, uh, appropriate, that that's uh, debatable. But uh, in any case, Orak would then be a, a noun, uh, the neck, your hand on, on the neck. Whereas uh, if you read Yodaka, they will praise you. Then the aura has to be repointed now to become an infinitive construct, and, and uh, there are nouns uh, that are uh, then uh, that become verbs, or verbs that are taken from nouns, noun, denominative uh, nouns. And uh, uh, in this case, then the force of it uh, would be uh, still meaning something to do with, with neck as case of the noun, but the denominative verb would have perhaps the force of breaking the neck. Huh? Yes, they will praise you when you break the neck uh, of your enemies. So that's a, another reading of it that has been suggested, and one further point that's sometimes made in, in support of it is that in poetry you do get in, in, in uh, adjoining clauses sometimes the, the use of the same word, the same verb, uh, the first time written plainly, fully, and the second time uh, uh, abbreviated, uh, and so that that the, the, that would account uh, uh, for Yoduka with the full writing and Yadika. So the, the, those are the considerations that have been. And I, I don't see a need for going along with those indications, but in any case, the meaning remains basically the same. That Judah is going to rise uh, to a position of supremacy uh, by virtue of uh, military uh, accomplishments. And then verse 9 supplements uh, this basic thought with the imagery that leads to the thought of the, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Uh, that comparison comes in. A, a lion's uh, wealth is, is uh, Judah, 
from the prey, my son, you have gone up. He crouches, he stoops down like a lion, yea, another term for lion or lioness, uh, and who would dare to rouse uh, him up? So here this just gives a little more vivid uh, color to the description of the, his military uh, lion-like uh, achievements. Now the key verse, of course, is the 10th verse. And so here's where we have our messianic designation. What we have so far then uh, is uh, definitely a, a, an inscription, a prediction of, of the, the, the entering of Judah uh, onto the throne, into the position of royal leadership. And uh, now verse 10 goes beyond that. And uh, it tells us that once this happens, once Judah becomes uh, the focus of uh, the, the, the royal dynasty, which of course happens with David, and uh, which becomes the occasion for a whole covenant arrangement in Second Samuel 7 and so on, the Davidic covenant, uh, which is, uh, seals and fulfills uh, this particular prophecy. And, and, but once that happens, and uh, David of the tribe of Judah is uh, placed there, and then we are assured here, as Second Samuel 7 itself picks up, and says that, that this dynasty is going to last permanently. Huh? Uh, and, uh, and which, of course, is realized then in the rising of the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, as, as the king who reigns forever on the throne of, uh, of uh, David. And so verse 10 now is uh, making that same point. That this this uh, new kingship in, in Judah is one that will uh, last uh, forever, not will turn aside, and, and so uh, what has gone before is summed up now in the word Sheba, the, the, the scepter. The scepter has been established in Judah, and once established there, it will not turn aside from Judah. And now, again, we have this parallelism, and in, in, instead of Sheba, we have the Michal cake, the term for the, the, the ruling staff, uh, the, the emblematic, once again, of the, the rulership. And uh, the, the text then reads, uh, reading in the negative again here, nor the, the ruler staff, uh, in fact, reading in the, the verb as well. This is a, uh, another good example. They're frequent and all over the place of, of uh, the, the double duty use uh, of, uh, of terms uh, expressed in one half of the parallelism, not repeated in the second half, but obviously to be understood. And in this case, it's the uh, low yasur, <coughs> the low yasur of the, of the first line uh, that has to be uh, uh, used again, double duty in the second line. So not shall depart the scepter from Judah, yes, not shall depart the ruler's staff. And now instead of saying from Judah, uh, you have Mebain Radla. And uh, you expect some sort of parallelism there, uh, but you don't get it on the usual understanding of of Mabain Ragla, which uh, would be literally translated from between his feet. And uh, so the picture then would simply emerge of the king sitting on his uh, throne with his scepter uh, and uh, located uh, perhaps between uh, his uh, feet on, on uh, the, the footstool. But I think uh, that actually misses the, the, the point here that that would be no parallel to from, from Judah. That is from uh, the the first part is said that the scepter will not depart from among Judah's descendants, is what it's saying. And really the second line is saying that uh, the same thing if one recognizes a euphemism that is here, the feet being a euphemism for the genitals. And so the thought is, uh, from up between your feet is the issue, you know, the offspring, the ongoing dynasty. And so it is a doubling of the thought and that uh, the rulership will continue, will not depart uh, from uh, this ongoing line of Judah's uh, descendants, and uh, until now, this brings us, uh, it will start here with David, <coughs> and it will continue in that uh, Judahite Davidic uh, line on, until, and now of course, Ad, un, until, or, or just the word until in any kind of language, uh, it would be uh, possibly suggesting one or two things. It, it, it could mean that it will continue until that point and then terminate. That that could be the implication of until. Uh, but it need not be a point for any termination. It, it could also, of course, be uh, saying that it will continue that long and without any implication of termination. In fact, uh, uh, suggesting that it would then, in that 
climactic person uh, to whom it, it leads, uh, it would be uh, made permanent uh, forever, and that, of course, is that that be the force of it here, and that, that this kinship will extend from David to Christ, and that won't be the end of it, but that will be just the, really the beginning of the real thing, which will go on forever. And so how is that expressed? Uh, that's expressed by saying, until Yavo Shilo. Now there is the crux of the whole thing, and, and the Israel and the different Jews come in, a lot of them recognizing it's Messianic, and, and yet the particular meaning of the thing uh, varying considerably. And uh, I'll, I'll just give you one understanding of it for the moment, uh, which is the one I would favor, but uh, you can understand by the time we look at all the evidence why others uh, would favor other views, including those who did the NIV translation of this verse, which, as I recall, has <coughs> one, one view in, in the text, and then in, in the margins uh, suggest a couple of uh, alternatives that would be looking at. I favor the view that Shiloh is to be understood as a name of an individual, of the Messiah indeed, and so I would settle uh, just by transliterating uh, until Shiloh comes. It's a messianic uh, a name, and the kingship will remain in the line of David until Christ Shiloh comes, and of course in him he made uh, permanent, and so we'll come back and, and discuss uh, that, but just to get the full verse and the full picture first, uh, until Shiloh comes, and then it says to him, Rilo, Yikahat Amim, to him will be the obedience of the Amim, uh, which is the, the nations. Now, as we said in the days of, 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 uh, of Jacob, when uh, Joseph had the preeminence and uh, yeah, the dreams were his brothers, uh, those things are represented his brothers. We're bowing down uh, to him. Uh, his rulership, uh, the Joseph leadership, or for that matter, Jacob's uh, patriarchal leadership, extended uh, to uh, the twelve uh, uh, son community as, as such. But when, and uh, and that was the case too with, with David when kingship was established later on in Judah. But when you come to Shiloh, you get universalism. So you move beyond the ethnic particularism uh, of uh, the Old Testament with its national election of Israel, you move beyond that uh, to the, the universalism uh, that had been uh, projected in uh, the blessing on Jacob of all the Jacobites coming into the covenant tents, and had been uh, repeated in uh, those uh, promises of uh, the Abrahamic covenant that all the nations would be blessed in, in that promised messianic seed of Abraham, and then here's here is in, in line with that the, the thought that, the, that there will be a, a universal bowing down and recognition of, of Shiva uh, when, when he, he arrives. And uh, let's stop there for the moment. And uh, verses 11 and, and, and 12 uh, then have some uh, further description of this messianic reign. And, they're even more cryptic than the language we've had uh, up to this uh, point. All right, so Messianic prophecy, uh, the sufferings of Christ, and the glory that would follow. Now, up to this point, uh, this Messianic prophecy is all glory, certainly. Uh, it's the, the glory of the victor, it's the glory of uh, the king, and uh, the glory of the one who has <coughs> a universal acclaim and obedience, uh, and the suggestions of of, of, of the suffering that will be part of it all, I, I think can be detected in the next couple of verses, but uh, the, uh, as I say, they're, they're much more cryptic even than what we have up to this point. But let, let's uh, tarry for a while here with, with the 10th verse and, and the questions that sur surround the, the uh, understanding of the term uh, Shiloh. Uh, my view of the thing, uh, Shiloh, would be uh, derived uh, from a verb, Mishin Lamed Hei Shalah, and uh, there is a corresponding noun, Shin Lamed Vav Hei Shalah, and the Shalah has the thought of the at, at the peace and uh, at ease, and likewise the, the corresponding noun. And, and for illustrations of this, I suggest we turn to Psalm 122. Psalm 122, verses uh, 6 and 
seven, where we, we have the, the, the verb shalah and the noun shalah that I have in my uh, adult before us. And uh, just as a formal literary feature here in, in Psalm 122, verses 6 and 7, we have the same sort of, of uh, repetitive sounds that we, we found there in, in uh, Yehuda, Yoduka, Yadika, that there was a repetition of uh, certain uh, consonants. In this case, there are a lot of shins and lamets. Uh, the, the verb itself is shin, lamet, uh, hey. Uh, but the, the thing begins then with the verb sha'al, shin, alaf, lamet, uh, which means to make requests for, to pray for. And so it says sha'alu, make requests for, pray for. And then the next word, more shins and lamets, shalom, shalom, pray for the peace. And then again, Yerushalayim, so uh, again, the same sounds, they keep repeating all the way through. And already now in the word Shalom, we have the, the word which is going to be running parallel to the word that we're concerned about, and you begin already to get then the feeling of what Shiloh has to do with it, it has to do with Shalom. It's <clears throat> and so pray for the Shalom, the peace of Jerusalem, and, and then <clears throat> you get next the verb we're talking about, the verb Shalah, in the form Yishlayu, yes, and the subject is Oh Havaya. May those who love you, that is, who love Jerusalem, may they be at peace. May the enemies be destroyed, but may those who love Jerusalem, may, may they have a Shalom experience. Uh, so the, the, the parallelism of the verb Shalom with Shalom gives you the basic thrust of the Shalom. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you have peace. May they have peace and prosperity. Then the next verse, verse 7, it continues the same thought. It uses shalom again, but instead of the verb shalah, you'll see in your text there, it now has the noun, shalwa, shimbaba, debate. And verse 7 reads, yes, let there be shalom uh, within your walls, that they lay Jerusalem's walls, and then parallel to shalom is shalwa. And yes, may there be security uh, within your towers. So the the force of, of Shiloh, as I see it, is, is very much uh, brought out there in these expressions concerning the, the throne site of, of the king Shiloh, the, the site of, of Jerusalem. Now, that would be uh, one classic uh, traditional view of of uh, Shiloh, but uh, there are there are others, and maybe this would be a good point if someone has an NIV handy. Uh, anyone have an NIV? Yes, uh, if, if you can read how they translated the, their preference in, in the text itself. Uh, the verse, uh, what is it? Uh, verse 10, huh? Yeah, 49, 10. Until he comes to whom it uh, belongs, instead of taking it uh, then as, a, as a proper name. Now, uh, the, and so the, that's the question, where, did, where does that come from? And then in the, in, you give us the footnotes. Or until Shiloh comes, or until he comes to whom the tribute belongs. Okay, uh, so they, they, uh, they give us one option in the footnote with the view that I'm favoring here, but then as a third view, uh, until he, what's the third one again? Until he comes to whom tribute. Okay, to whom tribute that he loves. So there are three possible views. None of those I actually uh, repeats the, the, the interpretation of, of Shiloh, which many have held that it's uh, the name of the city, Shiloh. And uh, now, the, the name of the city Shiloh is never spelled exactly the way uh, this name Shiloh is uh, spelled uh, here, uh, but conceivably you could explain the, the, the differences and, 
and uh, they see the name Shiloh and the name of the town. But I've never been able to understand how in, in the actual history uh, the, that would fit to this context. So this context is saying now that, that the, the, the kingship is going to be established uh, in Judah and remain there until some future point. And in, in terms of Shiloh, how would that, that, that the, the, the kingship had not been established, now some sort of leadership in the in the in, in the arrangement of the march through the wilderness, you might say, had, had been assigned to, to Judah. But that, that's not the interest of the scepter. That's that's not uh, that is not kingship. And um, and uh, and so by the time that they had uh, come to Shiloh in, in, in their settlement and, and conquest. Kingship had not been established uh, uh, there at Silo, and so that doesn't fit. And at no point after the, the kingship is established, uh, David is in Shiloh playing an inconspicuous role. So I've never been able quite to, to see how the, that would fit the, the historical uh, facts. And apparently the NIV uh, people uh, agreed on that and didn't offer that even as uh, as one of the options. So let's just deal with the, with the ones that they they do suggest that the first one uh, is uh, until he comes to whom it belongs. Is that right? That that's it in, in the text. Now, why they they selected that? I think you will, you will be able to uh, appreciate what they, they are doing. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, let's turn to another passage. So this time to Ezekiel 21, uh, where one could readily understand that the Ezekiel is here giving us an exegesis of uh, of, of Genesis 49. Ezekiel 32, uh, no, excuse me, Ezekiel 21, and verse 32, if you were lo looking at an English Bible for comparison, it would be uh, a little different numbering there would be, in the English it would be verse 27. In the Hebrew, Ezekiel 21, 32, and the English, uh, verse 27. <coughs> what we have here is a prediction of, of the, uh, the collapse of, of, of Judah and the, the the ending of, of the, the monarchy, as a matter of fact, uh, because of course, in, in spite of this this wonderful promise that the, the kingship would not be part until Shiloh uh, came and consummated it, of course, the typological uh, kingship was terminated. There, there was an interruption in there was an interruption in, uh, in that the experience of the Davidic dynasty, but it was not one that uh, cut it off uh, forever. Uh, Things still led up to uh, to the uh, Messiah, and and here we have uh, that interruption, that that termination of the typological uh, level of ministry. And uh, let's uh, look at verse 32 in the Hebrew. Okay, maybe yeah, all right. Uh, it, it begins now with uh, well. Let's look at verse 31. Uh, thus says Adonai Yahweh, remove uh, the, the turban, lift up uh, the crowns. And now he's talking about the king. The king's been wearing the, the royal turban and so on, uh, but he's going to lose it. And so the command goes forth to, to lift up, to take away the, the royal crown. Then it has zot lo zot. You know what these words mean. <coughs> this, not this. Uh, how does that fit in? And I think the, the way to understand it, you've had the royalty, but now remove the royal crown, the royalty is not going to continue. Things are not going to be the same here within this covenant community. It will no longer have its, its own monarchy. Zot lo zot, this will not be uh, this anymore. And so the command goes forth uh, to make low that which is high and, and to exalt uh, that which is low. In other words, they're coming upon a time when everything is going to be topsy-turvy, upside down. And they're going to go into exile. Things won't be the same anymore. Now it's uh, following upon that prediction then of calamity that we get verse 32 and uh, introduced by the threefold use of the word for a ruin, a ruin, a ruin, a wah, a wah, a wah. Uh, that's the, the dispersion, the exile, and, and so on. Uh, I will make it God threatening to turn the whole thing into a ruin. And then it, it, it says again, Gamzot, 
lo haya, up above who is zot, lo zot, this will not be uh, this. And uh, here he's saying, uh, yes, indeed, this monarchy situation, lo haya, will not be realized again. It will not take place again. Now, the next few words are the ones uh, that would be the interpretation uh, of Shiloh. Uh, it, paraphrasing, he was saying that the monarchy will not be restored. Huh? The monarchy will not be restored ad bo asher lo hamishpat until the one to whom the judgment, the royal judgment belongs, has come. The subject then is asher lo hamishpat, the one to whom the kingship, the royalty, expressed by the word mishpat, judgment, the one to whom the royal judgment belongs until he comes, and then I will give it to him. So we're waiting for Messiah, and when the Messiah arrives, then the Lord will, will give this uh, interrupted uh, dynastic rule of David uh, to him. And so what has happened to Shiloh? Shiloh has been parceled into uh, the, the chef, the sheen, understood as asher, the relative pronoun. All right, and then the, the uh, Lamed uh, and, and the whole of in Shiloh is regarded as a preposition Lamed and the predominant suffix, and so on. Relative pronoun, Asher, and its abbreviated form, Sheh, together with the preposition Lamed and the predominant suffix, which to him, the one to whom it, it belongs. And uh, so uh, certainly Ezekiel has an eye on Genesis 49. And is doing something with it. The question is, is it his intention to be giving you an etymological uh, uh, definition or interpretation of Shiloh, or is this another wordplay, which I would have to say it is uh, uh, on my view that Shiloh is, uh, is a name derived from Shalah, having to do with the Ajit piece and so on. So that, that would be my understanding, that, that he, is, he is punning with that and getting out of, uh, out of the name the Shiloh, the, the thought that, that and Shilo is, is the one who is the legitimate heir uh, uh, to the throne. But you can well understand how, in the light of the Ezekiel thing, uh, the NIV people prefer to the other view in, in, uh, in, in the text. And uh, further, there is a, a support for that in, in the Septuagint. There are a couple of different uh, Greek traditions in the treatment of this. Uh, both of them uh, having to do with a, a similar division of Shiloh into a relative pronoun and, and the, the, that preposition and phenomenal suffix. So that the reading would become on, on one in the Septuagint tradition and until that which belongs to him, the, the, the scepter will not depart from Judah until that which belongs to him, Asherlo, that which belongs to him, namely until that which belongs to Judah has come. And what belongs to Judah? Well, the, the Messiah. So this would be another messianic interpretation, but it would be understood that way. And then the other Septuagint the tradition is more in line, I guess, with the, the NIV's uh, option, where you would take the Asher Lo as uh, not the Messiah who belongs to Judah, but as uh, until he comes to whom it belongs. And, and so uh, that which belongs to him is, is the royalty, and, and uh, the, the one to whom it belongs, in this case, would be the uh, Messiah. So there is both the Ezekiel passage and then there is the uh, tradition of the Septuagint, which would divide Shiloh into a relative pronoun, preposition of phenomenal suffix, and that which is to him. Now the, the other uh, option in the footnote, please read again. And first they have possibility of reading it the way I would take it as Shiloh, but then the other, until, until, right, into, um, until he comes to until he comes, uh, uh, until he comes, uh, uh, to whom tribute belongs. Okay, this one uh, works with the same, and uh, there is a word, she, which has been found, for example, in Ugaritic, it is found in the meaning of a throne, and uh, it's argued that there's some evidence that uh, there is this word uh, in, in, in Hebrew as well. So the idea of a throne or, or, or dominion. And so instead of being a relative pronoun, which it would be dominion, and then the rest uh, to, to, to him. And, and so the scepter will not depart until he comes, namely 
one to whom tribute belongs. So that's all based on, on, on uh, that particular uh, lexical uh, possibility. While we're at it, the, the, uh, to mention some other uh, approaches other than the one people reflected in the NIV, uh, some have said that this is an Acadian loanword, uh, which uh, means that, that the counselor or, or, or ruler of some such uh, that meaning word shall do. Uh, another suggestion is that we, we don't look at, at Shiloh, uh, but we, we look at the word ad, which we have been assuming means until. Hmm? And uh, so this, uh, the word she has been discovered, which means throne or, or something to that effect. Uh, so a, another term, ad, has been found, uh, which uh, uh, also has that kind of a meaning of, of throne. And if we plug that in, uh, at this point, then what reason would it be? Uh, the scepter will not depart from Judah. Um, yea, the throne, let's see better look at the text and see how they, uh, let's get back to Genesis 49. Uh, let me read what I have here. Uh, the, the translation would then turn out to be, there are various ways of doing it, but the, the one I would suggest if you were going this route. Uh, his throne, his, the odd, his, his throne or dominion will will truly come. Odd would become the subject the, then of the verb ba. And uh, the thought would be his throne or the throne will truly come to Shiloh. Yea, to him will be the obedience of the people. So there's a beautiful parallelism that you get with the second clause, that to him will be the obedience of the people, which would be uh, you know, found already in the first part. Instead of obedience, it would be the dominion, uh, and uh, then will, will truly come to, uh, to Shiloh. That would be uh, Shiloh, and another question then uh, by itself. Well, here, here are some of the, uh, the suggestions that have been made in the, the, the it's perhaps the, the major ones, but there are some others uh, that, 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 that could be mentioned. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to stop it there for today. And, uh, now, next week, uh, no end of good things happen to you. Uh, <laughs> let's see, Tuesday, then we'll be ready for lectures throughout. And then the jam uh, on Wednesday will be uh, two hours, then both hours. And uh, for that, one question you know you're going to have is just to give the uh, surveys of the uh, various understandings of the other, uh, the servant of, of the Lord, and sort of a, a critical.